Good afternoon, everyone. I would, would like to introduce you to a group of people who are very much part of the community here in Reading for 300 years, and to their buildings, the Friary. This early 17th century map of Reading dates from about 70 years after both the Abbey and the Friary were closed down by Henry VIII, and shows the remnants of both. To the upper right, on the extreme northeast of the town, you can see the large precincts of the Abbey, with several remaining buildings. To the upper left, on the northwest of the town, you can see the Friary, although Speed has incorrectly named it. If you can see the letter A in the index, as the Priory. As we shall see, this is actually the second position of the Friary. The first one was to the north. Reading then, between the 13th and the 16th centuries, had its three churches, St. Mary, Lawrence, and Giles, its magnificent abbey, and the friary. So, who were these friars? Well, the great friars, of course, were named for the colour of their habit. They were of the order of Friars Minor, or Lesser Brothers, formed by Francis, later St. Francis of Assisi in 1209. What set the Franciscans apart from other orders, whether of monks or friars, was their extreme poverty. They weren't allowed to own anything or even to touch money. They went barefoot in all weathers. Probably not so bad in St. Francis's warm Italy, but not so good through the harsh English winters. Before looking at the arrival of these flies in Reading, let's consider the difference between a monk and a friar. Well, the monks came first, both historically and to Reading. Reading Abbey, as we've heard, was of the Cluniac order, when founded by King Henry I in 1121, although later it became Benedictine. Monks had, to quote, entered the religious house or monastery and had taken vows to remain there for the rest of their lives and to cut themselves off from the life of the world while they devoted themselves to liturgical, scholastic, and other kinds of work. Their main task was to perform what was called the Opus Dei, which meant attendance at a daily course of services. So his was the very definition of a cloistered life. In contrast to a monk, a friar's vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience did not cut him off from the world. The life of the friar involved him being among the people, mostly the poor. Many friars were also preachers, popular with the crowds because they spoke in a plain and accessible way. They were evangelists, bringing the good news of the Christian gospel to people who are unlikely to hear it any other way. They also performed the opus Dei, but weren't as bound to the services as monks. So monks enjoyed a good standard of living for the time, within what was probably a wealthy religious house. Friars lived hand to mouth, eating only what the local people had given them, out of the kindness of their hearts. Most monks were only seen during the divine services in their church. Friars visited people's homes and brought them comfort and help whenever possible. So you see, although easily confused, friars and monks were very different. Well, the friars minor arrived in England around 1224. And within 30 years, they set up about 50 Houses, as the friars were known. Some of these friars arrived in Reading in 1233, with significant backing both from the temporal and spiritual powers of the day, seeking some land from the abbey, as the lord of the manor, to establish a friary. Now the abbey was over 100 years old by the state, with Adam and Lathbury, Reading's 11th abbot, a contemporary source says, 
Through much insistence, they, that is the friars, obtained a place to live from the reluctant abbot. The abbey granted what we would call the Greenfield site, outside the town on the northwest corner, next to the road to Capture, for the friars to settle and to build their friary. The text on the slide is part of the document recording the grant to the friars. The abbey let the friars have land in the area called Baston, next to the road that led to Capuchin Bridge. And the area of the land was about five acres. The map shown here, of course, is from much later, but hopefully you can see the name of Baston, you really see it, in a couple of places, and an interesting diversion of the Portland Brook, a brook, sort of square in the middle. It's an irrigated area called Fire and Wind, which looks a bit like an orchard. Now sometimes this first priory is thought of as being next to the river, close to Cavishan Bridge. But for a few reasons, I don't think it was there. The next slide gives my best guess where this first priory was built. Now I've used the same map that have cleared away much of the late 18th, early 19th century building to create the space where the farm would have been. As I hope you can see from the modern map beside it, I believe that the friary roughly covered the area of Latcher Road to Tudor Road, down to Great Farmers Road. Briefly, let me tell you why I think the friary was built here and not beside the river. Firstly, because the name Vaston is associated with fields nearer the town than the river. Secondly, the old name Fiery Mead gives a strong hint of the location. And thirdly, the grant of extra land that we shall come onto, and upon which this church stands, was described as adjoining the original Fiery. And so the location makes no sense. Now the area shown here could easily have flooded periodically, a problem known to have been suffered by the first Fiery as it's not much above the level of ground immediately by the river. The placing of the various buildings is pure guesswork, as nothing is actually known from archaeology. What is shown would be a normal pattern for the time. Now the Reading House was the 18th of the 59 built in the English province. In the 1230s, all Franciscan buildings would have been built of wattle and dawn or of simply wood. It was built to house 12 friars and one wall, which was the minimum size of friary allowed by the order. Although it probably was designed with some spare capacity for visiting friars. Now, the Grey Friars arrived in England during the reign of King Henry III, the great great grandson of the Abbey's founder, Henry I. Henry III was notably generous to Franciscan foundations, and among those, he was most generous to the one Reading. He granted wood for their building materials, money for their cows and habits, and even instructed the sheriff of Berkshire to build some of the convent buildings, the chapter house, the dormitory. Now the site, however, as I've mentioned, was unsuitable as it was subject to periodic flooding. And this meant that the friars had to raise some of their buildings to a second floor so that they were usable. After suffering that periodic flooding for 50 years, the friars complained about the situation. The Archbishop of Canterbury, John Peckham, Franciscan himself, then wrote to Reading Abbey's abbot, Robert of Burgett, asking for an increase in the land grant to the friars. On 25th of May, 1285, the abbey made a grant of extra land, which joined the friary to New Street, now Friars Fry Street, of course. And importantly, this was uphill from the first day. The grant stated, Enrolment of deed by Robert, Abbot of Reading, in the convent of the same, witnessing that they have unanimously received as guests in the following manner the Friars' Manor at 
prize miners in the town of Reading. Upon a piece of ground between the house of Sir Stephen the Chaplain, rector of the church of Sulham on the east, and the sandy ditch on the west, and extending from the common way called New Street to the end of the piece of ground, the use whereof the friars have hitherto had and have and shall have henceforth of the abbot and convent's grace. So the story shows the likely area of extra land granted with a new church built at the highest point of the site. Again, apart from the church, this is pure guesswork in terms of the locations of the buildings. Those who state that the original firey was down by the river have to change the plain meaning of the grant which said that the new land given extended from Fire Street to adjoin the piece of ground, the use of which the fires appear to have. We are now in the nave of this second primary church. It was built from 1285 until the early years of the next century. Five estate Franciscan churches were built of stone and in the decorated or decorated Gothic style. The church was in three parts the nave for the public. A choir for the friars only, and a walkway connecting the friary cloister with Friar Street with a bell, bell tower above. Now, although John Speed's map may not have the detail of the friary correct, the tower in the middle of the church is clearly shown. And the tower can be illustrated by some of the scanty Franciscan ruins elsewhere in England. There are 13 sites in England with visible remains of their Franciscan buildings. We're in one of the oldest remains and the only one still in use as a church. These two towers show what the central part of the primary church here might have looked like. There are different designs, with King Lin King's Lins being a hexagonal tower and Richmond's rectangular. Speed's map suggests that the tower here was rectangular as at Richmond, but there's no way to be sure. The purpose of the tower was to hold the bell or bells that called out the hours of divine services. And the walkway beneath the tower was the main entrance to the nave of the public. They would enter from the street and come into the nave through a door in the wall behind me. Here's a plan showing the probable layout of the original Friary Church, with the walkway between the nave to the west and to the east. As you can see, the nave was actually rectangular, with no transepts. The walkway would have had the same width as the choir, and in the tower above, here there are at least two levels. Just has a floor, so I don't know how many. Definitely more than one. A staircase, probably internal and spiral, would have left led up from the walkway to the bells. The parts in black are the original 13th, early 14th century parts of this building. I'll say more about this in due course. But as I just mentioned, there's a door in the nave's east wall into the walkway, as shown in the next picture. Now this is my drawing of a drawing dated from 1860 by John Chesel Parker, now held in the British Library. It shows the central part of the wall behind me, just before the church was restored in 1862-1863, from its many years put to various other uses, including as a bridewell or prison from the 17th century. This east wall had to be knocked down and rebuilt in 1862 as it was unsafe due to burials that had undermined it. This is probably the only drawing of it before it was demolished. The doorway was four feet eight wide and about seven feet tall. And this is a comparison showing the size of the firing and the abbey, with the plans being roughly to match in scales. The length of the firing's nave, current 
the shelf to 77 feet 6 inches, compared to the Abbey's 200 foot nave. But as you can see, the widths weren't very different. When the church was restored in 1862-63, it was found that a large portion of the external stone was in a good state of preservation. A lot of the flintwork was also in a good state, merely requiring a bit of pointing. Therefore, around this is quite a lot of original building. And the most notable is the west window behind you. Although restored more than once, it's still as it was when it was built in 1300, not from the glass. Now the keynote of decorated Gothic is the kind of tracery that you can see in the upper half of the window. High up on the inside of the west window, although not visible from the ground, is the original mason's mark, which we'll have clear. It is, uh, it is now slightly damaged, unfortunately. I shall leave you to imagine how I got up to near the heart <laughs> of the top of the west window to take that photograph. <laughs> Now the north, west, and south walls of the nave, not including the transepts, and the windows in them are original. The arches are original, as is much of the stone in the four westernmost columns, though the stone has been much repaired. On the west wall, at the end of the arches, are four 14th century headstones. They're generally not in a good condition, although two of them, judging from their hairstyles, remain recognisable as the faces of friars. The headstocks are swearing in the church on the 19th century. Now to whom was the friary dedicated? St. Mary's, St. Francis, St. Giles, about the friary. Of the 17 friaries built before Reading, only 11 dedications are known. The ten of them is out of St. Francis. Of the 58 Franciscan houses in England and Wales, other than Reading, I can find dedications for 36 of them. 32 of them is out of St. Francis, with three for St. Mary, Salisbury, Stafford, Walsingham, and one for St. John the Baptist, Dexter. And the only source for a title for the Reading House is from the Reverend Charles Coates, 1802, one of the history of Reading. He said of the primary that the house is said to have been dedicated to St. James. But unfortunately, it doesn't say who said so. If you read this anywhere else, the source would have been that state and the Caddis. Seventy six years before Coates, the Franciscan historian, Anthony Parkinson, wrote of Reading. Here was a famous convent of Franciscans, but I cannot learn what is the title of the house that is its dedication. So, if we're to believe the uncorroborated source in Coates, I'm not sure that I do. Reading was unusual in not being dedicated to St. Francis, but rather to St. James. If so, perhaps it was to reflect the saint's local popularity, since the Abbey possessed the hand of St. James as one of its relics. Alternatively, since there was no occurrence of the attribution to St. James before 1802, namely that Coates' unnamed source was in heaven. Now the Friary buildings and fields were surrounded by a perimeter wall with at least one gate. The picture on the upper right is to remind us of the drawing from Speed's map in the early 17th century, showing the main gate. And the photo is the only surviving example in England of such Franciscan Friday gates from the remains of Dunwich on the south coast. So, what was life like at the Reading House? And how did the friars relate to the people of Reading? Well, the opera stayed with the services through day and night were sung by the friars, as they were by the monks of Reading Abbey but without much pomp and ceremony. The friars' services on Sundays and festival days were popular with local people, as friars tended to sing the mass at a good tempo. 
The sermon would be given in the common tongue, although the rest of the service was in Latin. People were also encouraged to take shelter in the nave on days like today, rainy days, and a friar would take the opportunity of preaching a sermon to them. As I've said, we're in the nave now. To picture what it's like, you need to take off the transepts and put in a door behind you to the walkway, and then further door to the far beyond. The windows would have had stained glass in them. Originally, in their stained glass, Franciscans were only allowed to represent the cross, St. Francis, or St. Anthony of Padua. But in time, this was relaxed to include any saints that were linked to a particular locality or were in any way considered special by the friars. At the dissolution, the windows here were described as decked with grey friars. The walls were most likely covered with paintings, either images of saints or taken Bible stories. Some traces were found of a wall painting on the east wall at the Restoration. Not enough to distinguish that the painting was of. There would also be brightly painted statues in several places here in the nave, including at least one of them, probably the baby Jesus. In the side aisles, there would have been at least one chapel, probably three or four, with tombs and effigies fitted in between. This photo shows someone buried in a Franciscan habit, even though they were not in the order. People paid for the privilege of being buried in the Friary Church. And even more to be in the friar's habit when he returned. To a thought that this would ensure a good reception in the afterlife with the prayers of St. Francis on your behalf in purgatory. A little later, I'll show you a letter written by one of the wardens of this friar to someone for whom this was happen. The name floor was covered with these tiles. Those that survived until the restoration of the church in 1862 63 are gathered together and display in the door. The tiles are made of red clay in the white stick. And interestingly, they're not of a religious or even heraldic subject. Top left we have a hare and a collared hunting dog on the right. A geometrical pattern below and a wonderful antlered stag. These are among the few tiles that survived from an English Francis. Recently, of course, there's been the excavation of a medieval tile factory in Silver Street. I wonder if these tiles came from there. It seems quite clear. Picture then, the townspeople, the Reading, coming into the front of the church, sometime in the middle to late 14th century. As they entered the nave, they would see the side chapel, screened off but still visible, perhaps lingered by the tombs, also in the side aisle. They take time to look at the painted scenes on the walls, bowing prayer maybe before a painted statue. They would gasp at the colours of the light from the stained glass windows as the sun streamed in through them. Then they would stop to listen to the friar, one of the friars, as he gave the sermon, and strain to hear the chanting of the friars in the choir, they heard through the open doorways across the corridor of the doorway. And they would, of course, have had to stand. At least until the late 15th or early 16th century, when gradually city began to be provided. Here is a marvellous reconstruction of the Franciscan friary at Little Wassing. Next to it is the village marketplace called Friday Market, which unusually was run by the friars. Edward III granted them the right to hold the market each Friday in 1347. Now this picture enables us to see some of the features of the fire in North. We're looking south. And so the church has its choir to the left, the east. And it's made with side arms to the right. And the walkway and the altar in the middle. This building would have been very similar. In the upper right, Within the fire of precinct, we see orchards and beehives with sheep grazing. There are burial plots both near the nave and at the east end of the choir. In the upper left, there is what seems to be a herb 
and vegetable garden. Beyond the church to the south, the fiery buildings range, although in this view we can't see much more than their roofs. You might just be able to see some of the fire's heads in the cloister to the left of the church tower. Fiery land is bordered all around by the perimeter wall with a gate to the town. And as the friars owned the market in Walsingham, they had a permanent preaching cross in the marketplace. Here's a closer view. The friar was using the opportunity of the market gathering to preach from the cross. Not that he had a large crowd of companies to this end. However, usually the friar would carry a portable preaching cross. He was standing in a convenient spot where people could easily gather and then speak. The friar's sermons were, to quote, generally vivid, sometimes witty, and often very outspoken. The preachers not only expanded the scriptures, sometimes with considerable flights of imagination, they denounced injustices and moral failures, gave their views on political and social issues. The sermons went pastoral care and counselling. The friars preached in such a way that a good many people wanted to consult them afterwards or to make their confessions. One thing that didn't accompany preaching was any collection of money that was forbidden in the statutes of the Franciscan order. The very shape of Franciscan churches showed the great importance they placed on preaching. They built their names wider and shorter than other contemporary churches, with the aim of making them more suitable for hearing the sermon. For example, this fiery nave, not including the Bibles, is two and a half times longer than its width, while Reading Abbey's nave, not including the Bibles, was five times longer than its width. Now, abbeys were led by abbots and friaries by wardens, or sometimes local guardians. In the 305 year history of the Friary, in stark contrast to the complete list of abbots of Reading Abbey, I have so far found five names of wardens of the Reading Friary. To a large extent, this is because the appointment of wardens didn't require royal assent, unlike that of abbots, and so they weren't recorded in royal records. The whole Franciscan order worldwide was overseen by a minister general. Various provinces each had a minister provincial. The province was organised into custodies. Seven or eight of these in England, varying through the years. Reading's house was in the custody of Oxford. Annual meetings of the English province were attended by the custos or custodian of the custody the warden of each house, and a friar from each house, chosen by the friars. At the meeting, the warden of the house stood down from his position and could be replaced. Most wardens were no doubt re-elected, but those that did get replaced simply reverted to being an ordinary friar at the friary under the new warden's authority. Now on to ordinary friars. Each year at the provincial meeting, houses were required to give a list of those fathers who had died since the last meeting. Almost all of these records are now lost. One is the of 1328, and in it there are the names of five ready and grey fathers who had died over the previous year. Now, with just 12 fathers in the house, five deaths seems to suggest an epidemic of some sort. As no doubt occurred 20 years later, the Black Death hit England. By the way, the William of Ockham, in the middle of that list, is not the famous one after whom the Razor is named. That William of Ockham is indeed a contemporary of this William and was also a Franciscan friar that lived on until 1347. We hear of a few other people, other, but internationally known writers. William Butler and Thomas Ratner had both served as the Minister Provincial for England, Franciscan equivalents of the Archbishop of Canterbury. 
The last man to fire, Henry Allen, was named as witness to the will of John Stanshaw in 1516. It's interesting that it's called Stanshaw's Confessor. The list of fires we know by name is completed by the ones, together with the Walton Peter Shepherd, signed the deed of surrender of the house in 1538, which we shall come to soon. Both the warden and Brother Giles Coventry had STB written out of their names. This means that they were bachelors of sacred theology, theologians and well-educated. Each house was required to have at least one qualified theologian Henry Allen, of course, could rather the same person as the Henry Allen, who was John Stanshaw's confessor in 1516. If so, make it just 20 friars. Now, unfortunately, not many documents relating to Reading and Friar are still in existence. But here is one from the late 15th century, known as a letter of confraternity. It's written by the warden, Brother William, to Catherine Goddard and her son. It's a certificate, really, following a gift made by Catherine to the fire, assuring her of the friar's prayers, both while she lived and then, importantly, after her death. It goes on to say that after her death, when this letter is presented to the friar as proof, all shall be done for you, the letter says. That is customary to do for one of our own brethren deceased. Now this would mean burying within the friary, whether in the grounds or in the church is not specified, and almost certainly in a friar's hand. Another source of income, I don't intend to read that today. Another source of income was bequests left to the friary. There are 21 wills that are known at the moment with gifts. Here from 1477 is an extract from the very long will of John Lesh, perhaps better known as John Pagada, from his role as student of the Abbey. Among his many requests, which endowed three arms houses in St Mary's Butts to add to the five glory he built there, he left ten shillings to the Fry's Minor. July 1500, Margaret Twanier wrote her will. After entrusting her sinful soul unto Almighty God, she willed her body to be buried in the church of the Great Friars in Reading, in the chapel of the Blessed St. Francis, as near to the tomb where she buried her father and mother as could conveniently be arranged. The chapel of St. Francis was in the choir, but the main altar, as in all Franciscan choirs, was dedicated to St. Francis. Margaret also had money for a priest to sing last for her every three months for five years before her death. Apologies if that's a bit small to read. Now, the various ways that the Friary made money in the 15th and 16th centuries reflects the fact that the Franciscan ideal of poverty was no longer practiced in the same way as in the 14th century. We've met letters of confraternity and payments for saying masses. And here we have payments to Friar Peter for writing and noting the rebound and repaired parish books of St. Lawrence in 1531. Being an educated man who could be relied on to be able to write in these books, unlike the vicar of St. Lawrence's, Richard Beddoe, from the students, this must be the warden of the Friary, Peter Shepherd. Now we're nearly at the end of our story of the Friary. Less than a year before its dissolution, and over a year after the passing of the Act of Dissolution of Blessed Monasteries, this will was made by Alice Adams. She was among the last to be buried in the Great Friars Church in London. And she clearly had strong links to Reading, as she left several requests to both the Friary and the Friars there. Here I have isolated parts that refer to Reading Friary in the hope that it might make it a bit easier to read. There are four main requests, each beginning with IT, standing for IT. Also. First line To the Great Friars of Reading, 40 minutes. Second line To each friar that is 
priest dwelling in Benin, 12 pence, that is a shilling, and those. Then I give to the warden of the great fathers of Benin my cup fashioned like a pear with the cover. Final one, bottom three lines. To the convent of Reading at my month's mind, that's a mass said for the deceased a month after their death, 40 pence. And to every fire priest there dwelling, 8 pence. The bottom line, and every young fire, 4 pence. And to every boy, 2 pence. So here then, individual friars, even novices and boys, are receiving money. They are showing that far. The idea of poverty had changed. Now another method of raising cash was to allow people to retire to the primary and to pay for the privilege. This is called the corridor. In speed drawing of the primary, three large houses could clearly be seen. And these were probably the three mentioned by Cromwell's appointed Royal Commissioner for the Visitation of the Monasteries, Dr. John London. When London visited with a view to closing the priory down in September 1538, and to get all he could for the king in terms of valuables, he described the fire as having these three houses, one for the warden, one for Mr. Ogle, who presumably the king uh, since he was a king servant, and one for Lady St. Jane, as far as I know. The 300 year history of the Red Farm came to an end on the 13th of September 1538. As a result of Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries, all Franciscan farmers were closed and their assets seized in 1538 or early 1539. There was the pleasant fiction of a document of surrender, supposedly written by the warden and friars, expressing their realization that they were living falsely wanted to give up their status as fathers to live in the second world. This is a drawing held in the British Library showing the seals of the fire and of the wall that were attached to that surrender document. There was not a great deal of value to be plundered. There were just four books in the library, probably most of the way in the There was some lead. A trough fled at the well, another in the kitchen, and the lead covering the bell turret, although the poor of Reading soon stole most of that took away. There was very little in the way of plate or jewels. For example, there was just 14 ounces of gilt plate used for the altar, compared with 214 ounces at the Great Fires in Oxford. The grounds, including trees, an orchard, a pond, Fiery buildings other than the church were rented to Robert Stanshaw with thirty pounds payment to the crown, and six shillings and eight pence per annum. Church nave was granted to the town council as a guild hall, which it was until 1578, and it's due to that that it's still here. The building then became a type of poorhouse, known as a hospital, and in due course. House of Correction and Bridewell, well, both types of prison, until 1862 when it was restored to use as a church, opening the following year. This 18th century drawing of the building shows the west window bricked up to stop prisoners escaping. The choir and the walkway were demolished at some stage, certainly by the early 18th century. That was a sad moment. One Abbot Hugh was suffering a terrible death near the Abigail, executing on, executed on a charge of treason. The last warden of the Friary, Peter Shepherd, and Giles Coventry, brother of Reading House, were imprisoned in the Tower of London on the same charge of treason, awaiting their fate at the hands of Henry VIII and its chief minister, Thomas Cromwell. Not known for certain what happened to them, but they were most probably also Now, if you'd like to know more about the story of the church, add that coming up.
including details of the 16th and 21st century that I to cover here. It's a book you might want. I have a few copies with me. I'm working on a further book that looks in depth at the period covered by this talk. So please look out for the Great Rising Reading, 1233 to 1538. Thank you very much for coming. So, in terms of the transepts, 
they did some, they were doing some digging just outside here and thought they found foundations of what they believed was a north transept. Um, more likely, it was the foundation of the cloister, of, of the buildings beyond. That's not known for absolute sure. Um, but there's only one known English Franciscan building that actually had transepts. So again, it may have had a transept there, but it's actually unlikely. So, because they found some foundations of thought, well, look, it had transepts. If you had one there, it must have had one there. And uh, there was a pub, the Pigeons, at the time, uh, in where the South Transept is now, uh, which was also bought as part of the buying of the site, so they knocked that down. And then they put the transepts in, in that 1862-63 restoration of the church, um, trying to make it look like it was, but actually, making an error, most likely, in that. Um, one other thing to say on the back of that, you'll notice, of course, we don't have a chancel. Very unusual to be a T-shaped church, not a cross-shaped church. And this central part, if you, I'm sure you'll see it from the other side, it's just bricks. But the intention was to build the chancel, uh, the other side of the wall, so they didn't rebuild this east wall with flint in the, that area because they thought they were only going to be there again. They couldn't build the chancel at the time because the land belonged to Charles Andrews, a local worthy, who for some reason or other didn't want to sell his house off. And so they couldn't knock through into his garden and knock down his servants' quarters uh, at the time. Later they did actually, the church did buy the land uh, beside it for many years. Uh, the house there was used as very fast vicarage, as I'm sure you know. Or becoming a nursery. But even when they owned it, for some reason then impetus had gone and they didn't build the chancel. I think by then they liked it, the shape it was. So transepts 1862-63. I'm sure Matthew will be happy to talk to you afterwards if you have any questions you'd like to bring up. Is there a question? Uh, happy to talk to you afterwards if you'd like to bring any questions to you. I'd like on your behalf to say a very big thank you. Reading had been a rather dominated the conversation in Reading over the last few years. I understand the history of the work that's been done to it. But I think what Malcolm has done is to remind us that there was another very important religious house in the town. Um, important in all sorts of ways. Um, not only, but not least, that it remains one of the most important um, Franciscan buildings to survive in this country. We've been privileged to use it as our for our talk, but also for the work that it did. Um, and for and very important aspects of its history in the town, and indeed subsequent to the dissolution, uh, is becoming this, uh, this church. So, on your behalf, uh, can I express a very great, a very warm expression of thanks to Malcolm for his fascinating talk this afternoon? Thank you.